始める前にあのアナウンスですけれども、6時ぐらいから講師の方を囲んで、軽くあの食事をしますけれども、ご参加いただける方、ちょっと手を挙げていただけますでしょうか。参加可能ですよ。こちらいかがでしょう、参加可能な方は。無理。何人ぐらい参加可能、はい、はい、どうも、参加は。いけないですか。じゃあ今のところ八から十ぐらいです。三回いかがですか。あどうぞ。あのー、ぜひご参加いただければと。皆さんご参加いただけますか。職員。あそうなんですか。So,、uh, okay. so, shall we start again? So, third part is uh, uh, drone based infrastructure and、uh, drone use of the medical、uh, field. So, first speaker is Professor Helmut Fledinger, and、uh, he came to the Keio Business School in the past twice or three times to make his presentations. And、uh, today the, he talks about his own project in Okutama. And、uh, we are just behind the schedules, and、uh, maybe 80 minutes altogether of the third part. and、uh, Uh, just a little bit shorter than you expected, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, is, right. is that right? Okay. Okay. Could, could、yeah. you adjust、uh, as you like? All right. Okay. So first of all, I would like to, to thank、uh, Anegawa Sensei for having me here again. This is a great、uh, pleasure. And also on, on my previous occasion, I got a lot of encouragement for our work, and、uh, that led to a good result, I believe.、Um, Uh, also, last time,、uh, the previous times, I, I only give the, the vision for the drone, and、uh, this time I'm, I'm happy to present some concrete, tangible results in our work on the drone. So, I call it a drone as life infrastructure, the Oktama project. So, this project is set up as an industry, academia, government、uh, collaboration for RD and、uh, innovation. So, it has the three、uh, parties. The Academic part, that's the NI, my institute. The government part is Oktama、uh, government. And the industry part is an, an open、uh, platform where we welcome industries、uh, to collaborate with us to、um, implement、uh, this project. So、uh, I'm the scientific director of this project. And、uh, also, I would like to、uh, introduce、uh, Noki uh, Tadasan. He's working with me on this project, and he is leading the Part on the, on the social side and also make a collaboration、uh, with the industry.、Um, I show you some、uh, pictures here. That's Oktama. You see it has a, a, a lot of mountains. It's a very challenging environment, in fact,、uh, for the drone. And you still see the, the, the name Tokyo. It belongs to Tokyo. In fact, it is the last、uh, stop of the Chuosen, Oktama. So, we can reach it easily, and it is、uh, under the head of、uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government, which、uh, makes the processes smoother. So, this is a short video on our vision.
as well to finish up any uh, any other questions. Um, okay, so we, we, we had our, our press release um, in, in July. Oh, sorry. We had our press release in, in July and got a, a actually I was astonished at how much uh, feedback from the press uh, we received and that gave us uh, further uh, encouragement to further this project. I'm here showing the slide. This is from the, the one uh, newspaper. It's the uh, Sankei, Shimbun and Osaka, I believe. And they took a nice effort to, to outline the, the Oktama uh, situation. So for one, it represents what we always think it's like a typically Japanese situation. You have the aging uh, society, you have the declining uh, population. And on the other hand, uh, Oktama has a, what I would call like a small uh, disasters. In summer, there could be the fire in the woods. There's a lot of uh, wood there. And in winter, there could be the landslides. So there are not so many uh, streets connecting the places in Oktama. So easily, uh, some access route uh, could be, uh, could, could be uh, uh, banned. So this is a very a classical textbook example for the usage of drone. There are remote places, we have to bring food, we have possibly bring the medicine, but we cannot go there by any uh, transport such as uh, taking a car. So this is a typical and a very good example for usage of the drone. And also in, in Oktama, usually we have to convince people why not use the drone, but in Oktama, much it was the opposite already. They had a prioritized list of usage, uh, use cases uh, for the drone, and we're happy to collaborate with them to implement uh, the drone as life infrastructure. So um, I am from the IT side, actually. I'm uh, not so much from the health uh, side, but we apply our drones to, to the health uh, care situation. So in terms of the drones, there are actually three things. There is the hardware, the communication, the information technology part. The hardware, this is where, this is the drone. Just you have to, you need a drone which is reliable, has uh, some basic collision avoidance system. Uh, to communicate with the drone, you need a uh, communication. So currently uh, people use a uh, radio control and that's maybe the, the, the common image people have here, you're piloting your drone. However, we think this is uh, only the case now and we're in a transitory period where what we actually want, we want to control the drone via internet. So we are now applying to the government so that we can use 4G LTE technology to, to uh, supervise and, and control the drone. Uh, finally, information uh, technology, this is where our strength is. Uh, unmanned error systems, traffic management, all kinds of algorithm, artificial intelligence, deep learning, human machine interface to, to make a, such a life, drone as life infrastructure system. So I show you uh, some drones which we uh, are using or planning to use. Currently, uh, we use uh, the Phantom 4 the from DJI, this is actually a Chinese company. We are also um, talking to, to uh, Japanese manufacturers on, on, on their drones. And, and also there's the Matrix 100. This is like a research platform because what you eventually want to use, you want to have a, a drone which you yourself can easily adapt to your needs and you don't want to have a, a pre a custom made, uh, you, you don't want to have a, a, a one size fits all uh, drone. So those are the drones. And I'm coming now to the outline of my talk. First it's on, on UTM, Unmanned Aerial uh, Systems traffic management, I'll have a chapter on uh, delivery and security and uh, surveillance. So UTM is maybe something you, you wouldn't consider very uh, important, but in fact, we are not thinking just like the, this one person, one drone, which, which we always see. We imagine the future, many people would use a lot of drones. So I think for Germany, I know the number, they expect in a few years there would be one million drones flying around in the air and there would be one operator operating several drones at, at once. So we are already foreseeing such situation and, and want to work on this ahead. Uh, in terms of the, the business model in uh, UTM, the NASA is discussing this and they are not sure either. So either the government is gonna do it or some local government is doing it or a company is doing it, or several companies is doing it. Anyway, this is not our business. Our business is to, to make uh, the system. Um, as a background, I, I show you two 
uh, project uh, in, in Japan. The one on the left is uh, by Nonami Sensei from uh, Chiba University. He uses a drone and he's a control uh, theorist and, and makes the some graphical uh, shape for the collision avoidance system. On the other side, uh, you see a, a work by NICT, the National Institute of Communication Technologies. Uh, naturally, they work on the secure communication. So the point of showing the slide is that a lot of interesting work is done However, always we see only the one drone. They're not thinking about the many drones. So this is maybe the, the, the feature which separates our work. We want to uh, have uh, lots of drones in the air and uh, so, so see, foresee the challenges uh, of, of such a high density, low altitude airspace. And also, rather than just making the geographical shape, we also want to learn something. We want to fly over and we want to know what's going on on the ground. So two key notions in, in my work is uh, the supervisory control system and the U.S. traffic management system. So I make a, sch a schematic figure here. So you have uh, three operators. The, the blue one could, could be a, a hospital. Uh, the green one could, could be a convenience store. And, and the red one could be a disaster response. So what's in common is there's one operator supervising several drones. So no one is controlling a drone, like piloting a drone, like you, you drive your car. Basically, you just set the task and let the drones uh, do it automatically. So the, the interesting part is that they have a shared airspace. And this is where the UTM kicks in. So the role of the supervisory control system, or more simply ground control station, is that you get a service requests and you service them. You send the drones out to deliver and do some surveillance. So this is what, what you're going to do. However, you have no way to know who else is out there and what they are doing. So there must be some superior entity which monitors the whole situation and kicks in to avoid conflict, to resolve conflicts, which means to avoid collisions by all means. And I will talk uh, about these two concepts, and this is a not a medical prob problem now, but if it takes off, it becomes a big thing, there would be lots of drones, and then you need a, a solution for such problems. So first, I think there's a video. This shows our interface. Okay, so maybe it just shows our interface. Oh, okay, now it's working. <laughs> so here you have, uh, you have uh, the blue one is an operator. They have a few hubs. They send out the drones. The drones are servicing tasks. And the gray ones are just other drones from other operators. And um, at some point, two of them could clearly have a situation where they're about to collide on the collision course. UTM kicks in and, and makes us tell them <coughs> to avoid the possible collision. Now, uh, this is uh, also discussed now widely internationally. Uh, the, the, the NASA, of course, is, is developing their UTM. Also, uh, the in, in Germany, the, the, the Deutsche Flugsicherheit, which is the, the, the German Air Security Control, DHL, and other operators are working on it. This is a very recent news, actually. This is just like one one week back. Also, uh, Nokia comes out, makes the, the UTM, and in Japan we have the JUTM, the Japanese version of the UTM, also just established in this uh, July, and, and we are talking to them. So importantly, uh, for having the drone be a useful tool, uh, you, you have to take a step-by-step -step approach. So I defined uh, for our work uh, four phases where we want to develop uh, the drone as life infrastructure. So I start with the, the, the scenario. So first would be high intensity uh, confined space uh, scenario like a disaster case. So, so in, in several disasters, you, you will uh, hear on, on, on the news that several TV teams are going there, disaster response is going there. 
medics is going there. So they don't know anything about each other. They, they just, just go there, get their footage or do other things. And of course, this has a high likelihood of, 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 of collisions. So in this case, uh, the, the supervisor, the ground control is, is like the one entity which sends out the drones to, to uh, survey uh, the area and so do many others. The UTM function here is to monitor them and uh, detect conflicts and resolve them. So for a certain, in, in our approach, for a certain situations, the UTM would actually take control to make sure that uh, two or more uh, drones uh, would not uh, collide. And uh, this is our, our first phase, which we are now working on and uh, make also a press release next week on Friday. May maybe Tarzan can talk on that uh, briefly later. Um, so a very limiting factor of that is that it's still based on, on radio control. So you literally need to have visual line of sight. You're there and you see, okay, there's a fire over there and I just go over. We think this is uh, not a future <laughs> technology. So our, our next phase uh, makes an important change is the one would be beyond visual line of sight. You fly the drone, but you don't see the drone anymore. This requires new communication technology because the, the radio control cannot do it. So you need uh, some internet, in fact, like 4G LTE would be one example. And also uh, the from the uh, perspective of the ground control station, especially if you're in Octamo, you would notice you cannot just go from A to B. From A to B can be a lot of mountains and valleys and, and so on. So we need on the level of the ground control station also pass planning, that's another IT uh, topic, and uh, info on no-fly zones. So when I say the UTM uh, calculates the optimality of a task allocation or the uh, optimality of the plans, what I mean is like a UTM, after all, is a traffic management tool. So on the ground traffic, the, the traffic management tells you at this time these areas are crowded, you shouldn't go there. And similarly, uh, for, the, for the airspace, there could be very crowded areas which we want to avoid. In case of the ground traffic, <coughs> maybe you're losing time. In case of the drone, you're losing time, which means you are draining your battery, which means maybe you have to take your drone down because battery is, is a very limiting factor currently. So for two kilo payload, typically we only have the 30 minutes flying time. So if uh, your, your path uh, is not optimal, you might have to take a big detour and you lose a lot of battery. So that, that's, that's what we are thinking about in a next phase and, and we are talking to Tokyo Metropolitan Government on getting the permission to use the SIM card on the drone and then I think it's, it's getting very interesting. So the future phase is uh, mostly on, on, the, on, on the UTM part. So, so now it's, it's mostly a little bit chaotic situation <coughs> because uh, anyone in principle can fly anywhere taking any path and, and we have these possible collisions. Uh, we believe uh, that in maybe two or three years time the uh, NASA or JAXA, which is the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, would come up with, with more uh, clearly defined policies and also airspace uh, def uh, design. So you would have some corridors and if you're like a transport drone from Amazon, you have to take this uh, corridor and so on. That's airspace design. Mm -hmm. And of course, as, as any traffic management, you can take in more factors like, like weather conditions and so on. So these are our uh, four phases we, we, are, we are proposing and we are now in phase one. And I want to show you uh, the, the content of, of our press release here. You have uh, a situation with two ground control stations, ground control station one and ground control station two. Ground control station one controls the, the drone on the left and the middle one, and ground control station two controls the, the, the drone on the right. So as, as you can see in this uh, scheme, uh, the, the middle and the right drone are facing each other, and, and this bounding box, uh, the circle, determines what we call a deconfliction zone. So simply speaking, if, if they intersect, there is a possibility of collision because they are coming closer to each other and, and they are heading that in a future point in time, there would be 
a collision. So now, second step. First step, uh, there's a conflict detected at T1. Second step is the, the UTM is triggered. So the UTM has to do something. And also uh, the, the supervisory control that the ground control station operator has to be notified. I mean, they have uh, no chance to, to figure out the detailed velocities, which, which means uh, speed and direction, how to avoid in an optimal way, but they are acknowledged. So then in uh, step three, uh, the UTM is in control. That's between T1 and T3, and it would, it would uh, navigate the drone on a course, a path, so that it, these two, two drones are not uh, colliding. And then uh, the last part, that would be uh, number four. Uh, the, the conflict is resolved, and, and UTM releases uh, the control. So this is uh, our system. And of course, although I didn't particularly mention it, it assumes that at any time, and this is currently, I think we do it f five times per second, each drone would communicate to the UTM its position and velocity. So the UTM has full understanding of wha what's going on, and that's the basis for making uh, the calculation. So um, the algorithm behind that uh, is called ORCA, Optimal Reciprocal Collision Avoidance Algorithm, and it has two theoretical guarantees. The first one is a collision-free path. I mean, that's what we expect from a collision avoidance system. And the second one is minimal evasive behavior. So it would avoid the conflict, but it would do it in, in a way so that it loses minimal time or minimal distance, because this directly translates into uh, the battery uh, train. And so maybe not so much interest in the, the technical details, but be sure that uh, these uh, 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 algorithm is working. So just briefly, um, yeah, our project compared to what, what they are doing in the US, that the NASA is basically collaborating with Precision Hawk, and Precision Hawk, they develop a module, you see it here, the latest model, this is basically a, a, a component which is sitting on the drone, and it has a lot of communication capabilities. I think we, we are not going to do this, we're going to use the SIM card with, with uh, comparable uh, features and and also the NICD in in Japan is is using or taking advantage of uh, other frequencies in in the air like uh, 5 gigahertz or uh, 920 megahertz to to allow uh, other kinds of communications so i am now going to the second part of my talk this is a short part but it's maybe the part you are most interested in it is on uh, delivery medical delivery and Oktama, we are back in Oktama, and I think this is a very, very <coughs> nice example. So here we have the Oktama Hospital, and we have another place. Uh, this is the Nipuri uh, Temporary uh, Clinic. So the, 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 the background is Oktama town has a population of uh, roughly 5,300 uh, and, and a high rate of uh, aging. Nipara area has uh, just 110 people and 62 households. And it, it's kind of only accessible via one, one route. Yeah? And, and that's exactly what we think is uh, very important. For one, um, these people in Nipara maybe don't want to come to, uh, to Oktama uh, town, so they just use the temporary clinic. And uh, I'm not sure the details, but I think uh, Keo Daigaku already has been in Oktama before us and uh, had uh, some sort of remote uh, consultancy system. So I don't know whether it was done with, with Nipara, but Nipara would be the one case where we have the medical doctor in Oktama city, in the, in the hospital, and, and uh, remotely give the consultation to the people in Nipara. So now let's say we this uh, remote co consultation is uh, active, the, the doctor might request some blood or urine sample and using the drone to bring it uh, to the hospital. On the other hand, if we have to bring some prescription drugs to Nipara, um, we can use the drone again. You, you might think it's just 10 kilometers, just take a car. In fact, we took a car and uh, it, it, it took us 25 minutes and it's a rather rough course, I would say. And of course, uh, our main argument is that these streets are very sensitive to, to little 
disasters ahead, like a landslide. So people would be really cut off and they would crucially depend on, on, the, on the drone. Now, uh, the second motivating example is disaster response, of course. Uh, surveillance and, and monitoring the disaster, such as uh, landslide or the little fires we ha they have in uh, Oktama, and uh, food, water, medical uh, supply by drone. So this is our next goal, and this, uh, as you can easily imagine, this is clearly beyond visual line of sight, so we need uh, the, the 4G LTE, the SIM card, <coughs> on the drone uh, to get to Nipara and uh, deliver uh, the medicine. Now, uh, this, this is just a graphic, so what, how we imagine uh, these components. So, so you put, uh, and the good thing is uh, on a drone, this is, this is a platform, Matrix uh, 100, you can put a lot of ca capabilities on the drone, including uh, the, the medicine. Now, I'm moving on to uh, my last uh, part. This is on security and, and surveillance, uh, maybe an application area where it is easily understandable that the drone can be uh, very useful. And uh, maybe I would like to motivate it also from, from something you can easily understand. So, so the key product of, of our supervisory control system, which is an operator supervising several drones, is what we call a shared dynamic map. So of course already we have the many maps available and uh, people uh, today also have uh, mentioned about uh, the Google map and there are other maps, but these maps are basically static maps. So what we want to provide is a dynamic map. So also now for the, for the autonomous car, the NEC, Japanese company, they make a very, very accurate 3D map of Japan so these autonomous vehicles can smoothly drive around. However, what's important is like dynamic things which, which, which are not covered by uh, current maps, like where are the positions of the other cars and so on. So this is where we come in and we want to uh, recognize and track in real time dynamic objects and of course static <coughs> objects on the ground and provide them to a shared dynamic map. So this is a collaborative uh, topic and also in terms of the uh, the completion, uh, the, the completeness of the information. Of course, the, the Google can give you near real time information because they have uh, some probe cars and they, they just calculate the, the traffic, uh, predict the traffic uh, jam, and so on. Um, however, it, it is not uh, um, applicable to situations like an intersection where partially you have. Uh, probe cars and partially you have non-probe cars. You have to need the information of all the cars. So of course we cannot cover the whole space, but the space we cover, we have complete knowledge of what's going on on the ground. So now I'm going back uh, to the uh, several applications I had in mind uh, here for our shared dynamic map. Importantly, it should be relevant. So it should give you timely information, uh, key for surveillance, patrolling, disaster response, and so on, it should be uh, responsive to uh, changing priorities, and it should be accurate. So whatever it's recognized, we want to <laughs> recognize it accurately. And the, the services I have in mind are three, delivery, uh, traffic and crowd management, and, and surveillance, patrolling, uh, disaster response. And, and these are just uh, some example of dynamic objects. So for instance, uh, Komatsu might be interested, what kind of vehicles are out there and they are, are they in positions I expect them to be and, and, and so on. So this is, that they have uh, lots of sites, so it, it, it's possible to do it, but it, it's more efficient and uh, easier to do it with uh, by, by, by drone. Uh, the same as you might maybe not imagine is true for the for traffic. So I had a discussion with a uh, professor at Tokyo University, a traffic engineer, and he will see in Japan there's some sag sections. So if he would know the, the real-time trajectories, he could in real-time uh, modify the adaptive cruise control so that the, 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 the cars would, would react to each other in a slightly different way, and this could help uh, to avoid uh, the traffic uh, jam. Of course, human behavior is always interesting and important. So in terms of delivery, we might want to avoid places where there are many humans <laughs> who don't want to fly over. We want to uh, know the impact of the crowd on, on the traffic. 
and we want to recognize human uh, behavior on the ground. Uh, so the monkeys is maybe more specific to Oktama. We want to know where the, the monkeys are. And this is uh, one case of uh, tracking uh, the disaster like here as a fire. So uh, to launch the whole thing, get it going, I, I made a such a crowded slide, but uh, I, I just tell you the, the main points, and it has been mentioned before. So always uh, we have a human-machine collaboration, yeah? So it's in the car now, uh, the, the, the autonomous car would be a collaboration b b between the driver who is not really driving and, and the car, but sometimes has to be in charge. So we, we call it shared control between human and machine. Machines are so much better in doing several things, but still human has to be in the loop uh, to compensate for situations where the machine doesn't know what to do. And here we have uh, two types of collaborations, we have the collaboration between human and automated task allocation to make the relevant shared dynamic map, and we have the collaboration between the human and the machine, basically the deep learning method, uh, to make the accurate map. And the, the human in the loop shouldn't be too much task, but also <coughs> not be too bored, uh, because sometimes we really need them. So I quickly show now uh, an example of how this can work out. Um, so we have a situation of an operator has five drones and 13 targets uh, to service. Uh, a target area could be a place I have to deliver something or a place I have to go there and check up and get a, a ground truth. In a, in a disaster case, many people make a Twitter message and say my house is crushed and so we want to get the ground truth because sometimes people do not tell the truth. So the first example would be one where the machine helps the human because for the human, for the machine, it is very easy. Sorry. Okay. For the for the machine, it is very easy to 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 make uh, such a thing. So now on the way, visiting those areas. Uh, an emergent event happens, yeah? So this was not, we we're just going to, to a task uh, the, the number three, but on the way, by accident, we, we see a fire, so an emergent e event, and we need immediately some uh, decision. So, of course, uh, here the human has to uh, support uh, the machine, because sometimes it maybe just looked like a fire because it's shiny, but the location could be in, in a lake, so this would not, uh, uh, cannot be true, so the system makes a suggestion and uh, the human would uh, confirm this suggestion and then we play out the scenario by, by finishing up and, and recalculate all the uh, movements. So again, the machine is good by actually saying where the drones, which drones should go in which order and the human is uh, important when we talk about making some decisions where, where the system is not entirely sure what to do. So now I'm moving on to the, the, the second topic, which was to make the accurate uh, shared dynamic map. But to do this, I have to show you something related to core artificial intelligence and deep learning, in fact. This is what we are now doing. So here, uh, this is deep learning model for semantic segmentation of video captured by drones. So the, mm -hmm. the, the project goal is very easy to explain uh, what we get from the 4K camera from the drone, the, the, the video feed is something like on the left and what we want to have is something like on the right. <laughs> so here for each entity, each object for simplicity, uh, we, have, uh, we have it represented semantically. So uh, the, 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 build, the houses are all the red ones and maybe you see the car in the on the street that's, that's represented here in, in blue. So maybe already you heard about like some hype being happy that the cats can now be uh, distinguished from the dogs by, by the machine and that would be an image classification task. So I give you an image like a, like a leopard and then the, the, the machine learning should tell you what it is. And, and here you have the, the top five um, results from, from the machine. So what we are doing is semantic segmentation. It means for each pixel on, 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 on the image, we want to assign it uh, 
to uh, a label. So here, all these pixels uh, become trains and, and the other pixels become structure uh, or background. So we are moving from classification, which is already exciting, uh, but maybe now well understood to something which is more exciting, I believe. So um, what you see here is uh, like a deep uh, model and you have uh, a cat on the left, like a common cat, and then the result is like the probability whether it's a cat or, or some other animal. So basically it tells you one label. What we are doing is we want to take the same picture, but we create what we call, it's a kind of a heat map. So for each pixel it tells you where how likely it is to be a cat or be some, some dog or some, some other uh, object in this picture. So this is our research goal. Uh, to, to do this, uh, we are using the deep learning models and you see here uh, several of them uh, in terms of the, the accuracy is getting better and better. Actually, the accuracy of, of labeling became better than human, yeah? so <laughs> human is not the gold standard anymore. Deep learning models can give you the more higher accuracy. Of course, the, the bottleneck is that in order to make a good model, you have to look at several parameters. And in case of uh, the VC, VCG 16s, we have 138 million parameters. So, I mean, that's a lot of parameters to, to play around. So um, you have to confine this a little bit. Uh, what we are doing now is we, we are using one which is based on FCNA, so maybe you don't have a fully convolutional network with eight uh, stripes, so we're in this area, and quite concretely, we choose a ResNet 152 because it's light, it's easy to train, and it's very accurate. But to say it simply, the magic happens between the left picture and the right picture. The left picture is a one, you, you can push in a video, right? You can push in a video and it takes frame by frame and it pushes the picture through, in our case, 50 uh, layers and then it gives you the result. Each pixel is labeled uh, uh, correctly in, in, in most cases. Now, um, the, 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 the initial layers are more like on the feature extraction and the layers uh, are more on, 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 the, on the very application. So here, these are just some, hmm? some uh, examples. You know, it, you can just visually see how individual decisions make a benefit for our system. Maybe I, uh, important to mention is that why this magic can happen is, is related to some of these buzzwords. It's related to big data and it's related to graphical processing. In order to make it work, you need a lot of data. So for our system, we use, for instance, the ImageNet. It has 14 million images we, which we can use for our applications uh, to, to repurpose that. And there are many other, um, sorry, there are many other databases which we are also using. And, and the one for Octama is actually very small. Yeah? So we have uh, nine classes and we have uh, now 100 labeled <laughs> images. Not, not so much, but sufficient. And in order to get more variation, uh, you, you can crop them, you can uh, turn them. And the, the interesting finding was that initially I believed in order to make it good from the aerial view, we need a lot of images and video from the aerial view. What happened is that for the initial layers to train the model, you can just do use anything. And, and you see here to the top left that independently of we train it on the image net or we train it on, on the, the Pascal VOC, these basic shapes are actually very similar. So that was one of the reasons this thing is uh, working. And then only for the final layers of the deep model, we use our, our, our data from uh, Octama, which, which show the, the actual target application. There are other methods, uh, transfer learning, you can use uh, ensemble models, you just use several models and then some method uh, to decide. However, our application is for the drone, so it has to be a very light uh, model. And another thing is you, you can have several models and then you train a student, learns from all these teachers and, and kind of uh, inherits all, all, the, all, the, all the good uh, uh, capacities. And let me just show some 
uh, yeah, here, this, this is, so we have, okay, that's the point. I mean, maybe the details are not so interesting for you, but I want to show that we actually have results, yeah? So we implemented it, we are running it, and we are better than everyone else. Currently, yeah, because the deep learning is a very fast-paced uh, science. And here you, you see, you can just look at the pictures. We, we are improving, but this is an uh, early, uh, early stage. We are improving a little bit by using our uh, technologies. Here is another one with, with uh, data variation and without <laughs> data variation. And multi-source training also has an improvement. And, and here, this is another example. So here you have the more values which are maybe familiar to you. But our pixel accuracy is, is on the level of 92%. So this is pretty high if you compare it to what machine learning g gave you uh, before. And, and again, each pixel we assign to a label. And that's pretty challenging. So the next slide would show you the uh, a comparison. Wait a minute. Can I stop? I can, hmm? so I cannot stop it. Anyway, so you have the labels here, buildings, plants, uh, vehicles, and so on. on. On the upper half, you have the real image from the drone. On the lower half, you have uh, the semantic segmentation, so the output of our deep learning algorithm. And, and you see, if you compare it, it's, it's doing pretty good. Um, so in this case, I have to say that this is not a real-time situation. This has been tra done offline. That, that's why the beauty comes in. But I also can show you the, the real-time one. Uh, in, in case of real-time, I have to say we, we just exported it on, on the NVIDIA super chip. This is a credit card sized uh, graphical processing unit. And it, it doesn't look that good, but we made a no effort. And it's real-time. It has f three frames per second, we are working on that now. And here you also see the cars, I like the cars best. So you have in the real world, you have, maybe there's a difference between my computer and here. So you have the car here and in real time it catches the car and, and, and follows the car. I think this is uh, very beautiful. Of course, one issue you have here, you see it on, on, on the lower part, you have these white and black areas. The white areas is where the confidence of the deep learning is very high that it's a car, it's a building or so on. However, on the edges, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not so confident. Yeah? So again, we try to involve the, uh, the human to um, help here. So I think I'm already cutting into someone else's time, so I'm moving here really quickly. But uh, this is, of course, very hot. It's on multi-human action recognition uh, from video. So we want to have the video feed, and we want to recognize all the, we want to distinguish all the humans, and we want to identify what these guys are doing. And I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, security application. Of course, you have the, the cameras already, the fixed installations, but we can dynamically just go anywhere and check out what uh, people are doing. And this is now just uh, starting, and, and we are looking at such act uh, activities, human option, o object interaction, actions, and, and human to human interaction. And this is maybe, so CPR I is one of them which we want to identify. So this is the architecture. Uh, this slide basically talks about well-balanced human-machine interaction. There was a, a a very bad accident with a Tesla car. So the, the, the human was riding a Tesla car and the Tesla car could not identify that this is uh, a truck. So it went to the truck and that the person died. So this is an example where human-machine collaboration failed. The machine could not, maybe, I, I don't know this, but maybe could not with high confidence identify what is it. It should have asked the human help me, and maybe the human thinks, oh, it's a truck, and it's not a shield or anything. But this uh, didn't happen. And here we call it the irony of uh, automation. So you have a situation where you sh typically, in most of the cases, you have to do nothing. But in some specified moments, you have to be there, and you have to make a clever, a good decision, which can mean your life. And here we, we <coughs> suggest to use the EEG to, to measure the level of uh, attention. This is uh, the yeah, again of, uh, like uh, the things we want to do in in <laughs> Oc Octama, including the the social uh, study, the delivery system with uh, specified uh, families, 
here are our expected results in, in terms of an open platform where everyone can use our platform to write their own applications. So, so we would be uh, kind of the, 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 the layer between the, the application users and, and the real uh, system. And this is now my final slide. We made uh, the, the website, Dronet, it's called Dronet Silicon Mountain uh, Japan where we promote our, our work and also show the, the, the video footage from our field tests every two weeks or now every week actually we go to Oktama and, and we, we make the experiment in, in the real world. And that's my final slide. Uh, maybe uh, Tarasan can follow up maybe even in Japanese in the press release if you want to say. And yeah, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>えっと、国立情報研究所のタロと申します。えっとですね、我々あの、ま、プレンディングアケンでですね、オクトママちょっとこうやって共同研究させてもらってるんですけれども、共同研究自体が始まったのはま、あの契約共同研究契約の締結が